Action Church, we doing well today? Everybody doing okay? Yeah. Well, Winter Park, Sanford, Oviedo, South, welcome once again. Starting a brand new series here in 2022 uh, called Too Good to Not Believe. We're basing off that song that we just sang, and I can't wait to really share these next four weeks uh, of messages with you. We're gonna be in the Old Testament today, uh, but we're gonna jump through three stories of Jesus uh, healing and miracles over the next four weeks. Just, just heading into this year, deciding that, that our God is too good to not believe, that it's not just something we come and learn, it's not just something of, of religion or, or, or something that we have to do, a list of do's and don'ts, that we can celebrate both in Scripture and in our own lives, in our own church, that we serve a God, that we worship a God that is just too good to not believe. You may argue, they may be come in contradiction, there may be opinions that say God is not real or he's not active, but we don't just have to study it or read about it, that we can declare that we've seen, that our God is just too good not to believe that he's real and he's active and he's, he's all powerful. If we're not careful, if we're not careful, we'll go with that other tagline that's really popular, that it's too good to be true. See, too often we think God and the things of God and maybe church or moments like we just had when that was too good to be true. But I'm here to tell you that our God is too good to not believe. He's not, he's not too good to be true. Come on, he's not like some slogans we've seen or some ads. He's not like Red Bull. It says, Red Bull, give you wings. Don't try that. You will die. That's a lot. That's too good to be true. It's too good to be true. Come on, it's like kids eat free with the purchase of $1,000 of adult meals. It's too good to be true. You get that coupon in the mail, 30% off, 40% off if you buy the entire store. It's just, it's the fine print. And we hear these, we hear these taglines, we hear these ads, we hear these salesmen, we hear these promises from the world that we know there's fine print. We know that it's too good to be true, but I'm here to tell you today and I wanna show you over the next four weeks that we do not serve a God that is too good to be true. We serve a God that is too good to not believe. There is no fine print. He doesn't change and if he says it, he can do it and if he's done it for somebody else, then you and I can begin to seek him and put our faith that we can see God do the same thing in our situation. He's just too good to not believe and here's what it says in Psalms 23. It's gonna be our theme verse over the next four weeks, Psalms 23, verse six says, surely, everybody say surely. surely. Surely goodness, mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Surely his goodness and mercy will follow me. He's just too good. There's some things that we read in scripture like Ephesians chapter three, it says now to him, God, who is able to give us exceedingly abundantly, or, or in the NIV, immeasurably more than all we could ask, seek, think, or even imagine. We hear that, we're like, nah, too good to be true. Because we've lived a life of lack, or of short, or not measuring up, or just not quite having enough. What I wanna show you today is that God has more for your life. He has more for your relationships. He has more for your calling. He has more for the mission of our church. But if we're not careful, we get stuck and I don't have enough as opposed to seeking a God of more than enough. I got this picture a few years ago. I was actually traveling with uh, my, my son Bentley. He was young at the time and Kingston wasn't born yet. And, and uh, we were going on a beach trip and we forgot our beach toys. Anybody ever forgot what you were, go like you're going somewhere and you forgot the very thing that was gonna make the trip successful. And so we're right there by the beach and there's, there's no stores open. There's nothing open except a Kmart. Anybody ever been to a Kmart before? If you've been to a Kmart, no offense, but you understand why they're no longer in business. You know what I mean? Because like every other aisle was like, was like, the apocalypse happened, you know what I mean? It was like one aisle had enough, the next aisle had nothing, the next aisle had the same thing that the aisle before it had. It was just, it was a picture, and I think too many of us have settled for a, a Kmart type of faith. We just don't know if there's gonna be any, if there's gonna be something, if the stock is ready, and I'm just here to tell you today that God is never missing any product. He's never missing any answers. He's not Kmart, he's Amazon. You know, don't make that political. I'm just saying, like, you can go to space, you can order a T-shirt, it'll be at your house in 37 seconds. You know what I mean? Like, sometimes, sometimes you're gonna need something big, sometimes you're gonna need something small, but either way, with prime delivery, it's gonna be there in about an hour. It's creepy. It's creepy. God's not creepy, but he, he's better than Amazon. He has everything that you need. 
He really does. Our, our God is a God of, of immeasurably more, and he's still in the miracle business. We're going to read about a miracle today in 2 Kings chapter 4 with Elisha and the widow, and she's in a tough spot. She's in a tough spot. She's just lost her husband, and she's about to lose her sons to slavery because she can't pay her debtors. She can't pay her bills. She's in need of a miracle. So I know you walk in auditoriums like this, and maybe you're joining us. You found us online and you see a, a, a bunch of Christians, quote unquote, or a bunch of people that are, are happy. God must have given them everything. They must have, have everything. It must be successful. It must be easy. I wanna show you a story of God meeting this lady in her time of need, this widow in her time of lack, in her time of maybe some of the worst moments of her life, and, and God giving her a miracle that she needed. I wanna talk about our God who is too good to, to not believe. We'll start reading together, 2 Kings chapter 4. I wanna read all seven verses and then we'll kind of unpack it verse by verse today. It was one day the widow of a member of the group of prophets came to Elisha. Elisha, you remember he took over for Elijah as the, in the group of prophets, the leader. He says, my husband who served you is dead and you know how he feared the Lord. But now a creditor has come threatening to take away my two sons as slaves. What can I do to help you, Elisha asked. Tell me, what do you have in the house? Nothing at all except a flask of olive oil, she replied. And Elisha said, borrow as many empty jars as you can from your friends and neighbors. Then go into your house with your sons and shut the door behind you. Pour olive oil from your flask into the jars, setting each one aside when it's filled. So she did, just as she was told. Her sons kept bringing jars to her and she filled one after another. Soon every container was full to the brim. Bring me another jar, she said to one of the sons. There aren't any more, he told her. And then the olive oil, it stopped flowing. When she told the man of God what happened, he said to her, now sell the olive oil and pay your debts and you and your sons can live on which that is left over. Today, we're asking the question, what do we do when we need a miracle? What do we do when we find ourselves in a situation like this where we don't have all the answers, where if God doesn't show up, if God doesn't make a move, if God doesn't stand in the gap, we don't know what we're going to do. Her situation is just about to go from bad to worse. She's lost her husband, and now she's on the verge of losing her two sons. She needs a miracle. She needs a, an immeasurably more moment with God. I wanna go verse by verse, and I wanna walk through this story because I think we can, can uh, uh, extrapolate this story and apply it to our life. Go to verse one, it says, that she cried out. One day the widow of a member of the group of prophets came to Elisha and cried out. She cried out for help to, to the man of God. She cried out for help to God. She cried out. That's why every single year, at the first of the year, we start our year in prayer and in fasting. We're starting tomorrow, Monday, at all of our locations, 6.30 a.m., Monday through Friday, and then Saturday at 9 a.m., and we're ending it next Sunday night with a, a special encounter night, a, a prayer service, a time of worship. We're really gonna seal all that God did through our time of prayer and fasting because we just believe that prayer is not a last resort, but a first response. Amen. The first thing she did when she needed something was she, she cried out to God. Come on, be honest with yourself today. I'll be honest, the first thing I do sometimes is stress, worry, strategize. She cried out. And when you're in need of a miracle, when you're in need of God to show up with his goodness and his mercy in your life, with his miracle working power, it should not be your last resort. It shouldn't be, I've tried everything else, so I come back to church. I've tried everything else, so I pray. No, my, my first response is, God, I don't know what to do. And we cry out to him. And I wanna talk about this time of prayer and fasting this year, because we could pray some measurable prayers. We could pray some some safe and average prayers. We could pray some things that just keep us the same or we could begin to cry out to God for more. We could begin to cry out to God for him to show up in such a way that we, we can't explain. Let me give you an example. Three measurable prayers that we could cry out to in this season of prayer and fasting and then three immeasurable prayers. Measurable prayers, this will be on the screen. God, God, give me just enough. Like, I just need enough for me and for mine. Just give me a job or give me a, an income where, where we're taken care of. God, 
keep me safe. If there's one thing that I would try and lead our church through in this season as we walk through every, all of the chaos, quit praying for safety. Pray for effectiveness. Too many Christians have stopped worshiping the Savior and started worshiping the idol, idol of safety. And I'm not saying to be irresponsible. I'm not saying to be stupid. I'm just saying God didn't call you to be safe. He called you to be effective. I'm just gonna sneak out of that one. God, give me just enough. God, keep me safe. God, change my situation. These are measurable prayers. Safe. Immeasurable prayers. Let's flip those. God, bless me with abundance so I can bless others. That's taking a risk. God, I don't want just enough. I want more than enough. Not because I'm selfish, not because I'm greedy, but because I want to be able to help others. I want to be able to receive all that you have for me and then give it away to others. Immeasurable prayers. God, use me by any means necessary to reach and connect people. Not safe, not easy, not comfortable. God, take me out of my comfort zone and use me by any means necessary to reach and connect people. Look at this last one. First one, uh, in measurable prayers, God changed my situation. Look at this last one. God, use whatever situation comes my way to change me to be more like you. James 1, count it all joy when you face trials and hardships. I don't just change my situation, change me. That was about as quiet in the second service as it was in the first service. <laughs> Verse two, let's keep going. It says this, what can I do to help you, Elisha asked. What can I do to help you? I wanna highlight here that, that, the, that the lady was asked what could, she, what could Elisha do to help because of the faithfulness of her late husband. He was serving the house of God. He was serving the prophet. He was faithful. It says he feared the Lord, which means he had built up a good reputation with the prophets. He had been effective in his ministry. And that's what the Bible calls us as the church. It calls us to reach the lost, but take care of the church family. And his faithfulness, his faithfulness paved the way for the miracle. His faithfulness, his life lived well, fearing the Lord, gave him access to the conversation with Elisha and then with God and for the miracle to happen. We cannot, we cannot read past, we cannot skim over that the faithfulness of the late husband initiated this conversation. What do you have? She says nothing at all. We'll get back to that a little bit later. But I need you to, to make sure you take note of this. God will always ask you to give what you have to get what you cannot without him. God will always ask you to give what you have. What do you have? It's not a, it's not a free ride. That salvation is free, but we're walking in obedience. We're walking in the call of God. He's gonna say, what do you have? What do you have at your fingertips? What do you have on the inside of you of gifts and talents and, and resources? What do you have? Have. Verse three, let's keep going. It says, and Elisha said, uh, borrow as many empty jars as you can from your friends and neighbors. I wanna highlight that. If you're taking notes, write that word borrow down. He said, borrow these. They were borrowed. They, they were not her jars. She had her flask of oil. She, she had her, her sons, but these, these jars had to be borrowed. They weren't hers, so she could not take credit for what was going on. She was just borrowing them. And I need to remind somebody today that you're just borrowing the gifts that God gave you. The gifts that God gave us are on loan from the Holy Spirit. It's a lease. Some of them are longer term than others, but it's a leased gift. We have borrowed the things of God. We do not own them. Everything that you're great at, everything that God's given you, the favor on your life, the blessings on your life, your, your, the things that you've done is not yours to own the credit for. God gave you that as a gift to be utilized for him. And guess what? You and I, we're not gonna be here forever. And when you and I go to heaven, those gifts don't go with us. They stay here because the gifts belong to the Holy Spirit. You and I are merely jars and we're borrowing this gift. I would have clapped there too. Thank you, Pastor Eddie. 
He made her borrow the jar so she couldn't take credit for the miracle. Too many of us, when we see God move, it inflates self. And I just need to remind somebody today, we are borrowing these gifts. We are borrowing these resources. Raise your hand if you created yourself in here. Nobody. So quit giving yourself so much credit for what you've done and give God the gratitude, worship, and praise that he allowed you to use the resources. She had to borrow so she wouldn't take credit. She borrowed it. She was a steward of, we steward the greatness of God. We don't own it. We borrow it. And in fact, that's what Action Church is doing. We'll be eight years old this year. And if you think that we think we're great, we're not. If you think that we planted what we're reaping, we did not. 15,000 people have been saved over the last eight years, and that is not because of us. That's because of decades of faithful church planters and church leaders and missionaries and intercessors planting, plowing, tilling the ground here. This is not us. This is not you. This is not an action thing. This is a God thing. We are simply borrowing some influence and borrowing some gifts and borrowing some resources for this time and this place. I'm just, I just want it to be less about us and more about him. That's why these jars are so important. They're borrowed. And this influence in this season, it's, it's a lease. It's got a time limit. Now that doesn't mean that we should not be effective and we should not be all in. It means that all the glory goes to God and not to, to us. I was really thinking this miracle series would be a lot more encouraging. It's coming out a little harsher. <laughs> I wrote down the vessels, the, the jars. They were to hold the oil, nothing more, nothing less. And that's what we do. We, we hold, we have access to the tangible presence of God. Let's keep reading together. Verse four, uh, chapter four, verse four. It says, then go into your house with your sons and shut the door. So many statements that can be overlooked, but I think that's important. She said, take the jars, take your oil, take your family and go into your house and, and shut the door. Because I believe that the miracles that God wants to do, the, the, the mission, the ministry that he wants to do, you and your family, you and your business, you, you personally to have, he wants it to happen in you before it happens through you. Go in and shut the door because God's got to do something in private before he shows himself through you in public. There's gotta be something that happens. They were the first one to receive the miracle. The miracle wasn't for everybody else to see. It was for them to see and then for them to share. And I'm here to tell you today that the miracles of God should never stop with you. They are for you, but they don't stop with you. They happen in private. They happen in your personal life so that you can then live it out publicly and share of the goodness and the greatness of God. In verse four, it says, shut the door. Then it says this in verse, uh, verse five, actually at the end of verse four, it says, shut the door, pour olive oil from your flask. Everybody say your flask. Your flask. Never thought you'd say flask in church. Like I can bring a flask in church, no. <laughs> it's called alcoholism. We've got action recovery on Monday nights. No flasks in church. Your flask into the jars, setting each one aside when it's filled. Your flask. I think we read scripture. We know the end of this story. We know that God provides, he does a miracle. But can we just pause for a moment when he says, take your flask and pour it into your borrowed jars. That would have been the last thing of value that she had. At that moment, she was releasing control to God. Now, she didn't have enough to pay for her sons, but that doesn't mean that giving the last little bit that you have in trust to God didn't cost her everything. And your level of sacrifice begins to develop your faith. She had to take a step. Don't miss it. Pouring her last bit of resource, her last bit of control, her last bit of I may can make it a few more days. She had to release all control when she poured that valuable oil into the jars. Here's the thing that I also see with the flask, with the jars, and with the sons, is that the miracle wasn't on the outside of the home, the miracle was in the house the whole time. The ingredients for the miracle that God wants to do in your life, in your situation, I'm just here to tell you today, more often than not, he's already given you the ingredients to play your part in receiving 
the miracle. The flask and the jars weren't important in themselves, but when you set it aside for a special purpose, when you begin to give it to God, it's amazing. It's amazing what he can do with it. Let's put up verse five on the screen, team. Verse five, she did as she was told, and her sons kept bringing jars to her, and she filled one after the other. She did as she was told. I don't think this miracle could happen in 2022. <laughs> Anybody else struggling with what year it is right now? Like just the last three years has like been a blur. I like I've been writing the wrong dates on checks. So like 2021, 2022, 2020. Some days I'm still living in 2020. I don't know what happened. But this miracle could not happen in 2021 because this next point is this, your level of obedience. She did what she was told. Your level of obedience demonstrates your faith. But in 2022, we don't have obedience, we have opinions. Nobody can tell me what to do. There's an attack on the word of God because it tells you what to do. There's an attack on God's character because he's God and we're not. And we don't understand him, we try and tear down his character. You better pick a different target. But that's what we do. God is not good, God is not merciful. We begin to twist scripture and question the character of God and you can't do it. Her obedience, it demonstrated her faith. Your obedience allows you to begin to walk into the, the miracles of God, the things of God. So many times we're looking for these big things, these big breakthroughs. And I think far too often we just give up one step short. We're just one obedient step away, just one time investing in something, one time sharing the love of God, one time believing one more day, fasting one more day, praying one more day. It's the obedience of our life that demonstrates our faith. The next scripture says this, talks about our sons. Let's go into verse five and six there, or I can go to my notes. Soon every container, let me, uh, I'll go here. That's my fault. It's like, hey, just throw up the screen I'm thinking, just throw up the scripture I'm thinking about on the screen. That's on me. So she did as she was told. Her sons kept bringing jars to her, and she filled one after the other. Soon every container was full to the brim. Bring me another jar, she said to one of her sons. Everyone was full to the brim. There is something powerful about what God does. He fills it to overflowing. He fills it right up to the edge. He fills everyone full to the brim. But before we talk about God filling us, I wanna go back to something that's, that oftentimes we feel like there are main characters and there are like minor characters in the story. The only main character in the miracles of God is God himself. The rest of us are just jars. Do you know that the miracle doesn't happen without the sweat of the sons? So you have the man of God, you have the intercessor. So you have the preacher and you have the prayer warrior, but you needed some people to go out and gather some jars. You need some parking team members. Somebody holding somebody's kid. Somebody wiping somebody's kid's butt. Somebody greeting. Somebody setting up and tearing down every single week at Oviedo. Without the sweat of the sons, there's nowhere to put the oil. So good. Too many times we discount our part in the miracle. We discount our part in the mission and say, well, I'm not the preacher and I'm not the prayer warrior, but no, 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 no. You have the gifts and talents and resources God gave you. And Without the sweat of the sons, we don't see the miracle. It says it was full to the brim because God is not just a God of just enough. He gives us everything we need to accomplish all that he's calling us to accomplish. There's oils, there's vessels. The oil in this scripture, the oil, it, it represents the presence of God. All throughout the Old Testament, New Testament, the, the oil represents the presence of God. So the oil that she had, the oil that you and I have to the Holy Spirit, you say, well, I've just got the Holy Spirit. That's not nothing, that's everything. Without the oil, we're just empty jars. Without the oil, we have unlimited potential but no purpose. Because the Spirit of God is the only thing that begin, can begin to make you walk into the plan that God has for you. 
We settle for potential and God wants to fill us with purpose. And I don't know why God chose to do it this way, but he chose to use you and me. I don't question God, but I do question me. I may have picked a different jar, a different vessel. Come on, you've been in seasons of your life, you think, God, I don't, I don't think that's me. I don't think you can use me. We have to have oil and we have to have jars. God has his presence and he needs you and I as willing vessels to inhabit, to be used in this earth. Again, he didn't, he didn't have to use us, he chose to use us. So don't get it mixed up that I'm saying God has to have us. No, he chose us. But it says when the jars ran out, the oil stopped flowing. Do you think that God ever runs out of oil? Ever runs out of his presence? ever runs out of his provision, ever runs out of his power? If you're thinking about it, no, he doesn't. He stops pouring out his power, his provision, his presence, his purpose when we run out of jars. When we run out of people to serve, to give, to lead, to love, churches stop growing. We run out of projects and resources to reach and connect people, the power and the presence, it stops there. And your family, when you're putting out a jar for your children, when you're putting out a jar for your struggle, when you're gathering some things because you need the oil, you need the power, you need the presence of God, when you begin to run out of faith for that situation, God stops pouring, not because he's done and not because he's of lack, because there's nowhere else to put it. And God's not gonna spill his presence, his oil on the floor. So when there's nowhere else to steward it, it stops. What I've seen oftentimes in my years of ministry and following God is oftentimes God meets us at the level of our expectation. Because he's infinite. And so he's saying, son, daughter, how much can you handle? How much do you want? How much do you believe? Say, Pastor, I don't have anything. You have the same response. I just got this flask. I just got this idea. I just, I just got this burden. I just got this, this passion. I just got this, this thing. I, I don't really have anything. I'm telling you, you have everything when you have the presence of God. She had a flask. Moses had a staff. What's important about a staff? Nothing. But it parted the Red Sea. Five loaves. A couple fish. Nothing important about the ingredients. What's important is they were given to God. And when God speaks and when God blesses and when God pours out, miracles happen. So I'm asking you today, what do you have? Nothing, no. You have something. And God is saying your level of sacrifice develops your faith. Your level of obedience demonstrates your faith. I'm asking you to give what you have to God and allow him to bless it. Allow him to multiply it. Closes in verse seven with this. It's, it's not just this moment. It's not just God showing up in power. It says, when she told the man of God, Elisha, what had happened, he said to her, now sell the olive oil pay your debts, and you and your sons can live on what's left over. He gave them more than enough because God is not just great, he's, he's good. There are always leftovers. When we seek God and when we believe in God and when we give and serve, God's always gonna give you more than you need to be a blessing to others when you walk in obedience. Wrote this down, the widow brought a flask, her family and a problem. She left with her debts paid, living in the miracle of God and enough to live on for the future. What we can do is always measurable, but what God can do through our measurable is exponential and even immeasurable. So let's give our lives to God, everything. Everything. Pastor Justin, I'm believing for a miracle. What are, you, what are you holding on to? What little bit of control? 
what little bit of worry and doubt. Say, Pastor, I haven't seen God be good in a long time. Your situation doesn't change his character. And he's just playing a much bigger game than we see. He's not just good on the mountaintop, he's good in the valley. He's not just good when the jars are full, he's good when the jars are empty. It's too good to not be. I wanna close with Psalm 23. I wanna read it from a slightly different perspective. Let's read the whole thing and then let's go back and read verse six with a different perspective. Let's start with verse six actually. So positive. And this is why people discount messages like this, series like this, even Christians, because they think we just have it easy and have it all together. We're just happy all the time. You see some of us in traffic watching our football team. Verse six, surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Let's read verses one through five. The Lord is my shepherd, I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams and he renews my strengths. He guides me along the right path, bringing honor to his name. All good, mountaintop, God is good. All the time, all the time, God is good. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, the King James, even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not be afraid, I will fear no evil, for you are close beside me. He's not just beside you in the green pastures, he's beside you in the valley of the shadow of death. He's not just a miracle worker when everything looks great. He's a miracle worker. He's good even when it doesn't. I will not be afraid for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect me and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. That sounds fun when we read it, but doesn't sound fun when you actually think about your enemies. I won't be around them. You honor me with anointing my head with oil. In the presence of God. When the presence of God comes, my cup overflows with blessing. What a connection. Here's where I wanna to get to. If you've ever walked through the valley of the shadow of death, if you've ever walked through seasons of grief or loss, betrayal, hurt, hardship, death, I don't think it's written, Psalm 23, a Psalm of David. I don't think it's surely. I think it's from a place of agony. This widow didn't have verse seven when verse one started. She had a dead husband, the sole provider of their family, and she was days away from losing her sons to slavery. Can you put yourself in the story? It's not surely God's good. It's agonizing. It's heavy. It's read like this, like surely, surely. How long have I been in this valley? How long have I felt like I'm surrounded by many? Surely, goodness and unfailing love will pursue me even when I don't want it, even when I, I'm not about it, even when I'm fearful and afraid, even when I'm doubtful and lacking and worried. Your goodness and mercy pursues me. All the days of my life, the good and the bad. As I walk in the goodness of God, I will live in the house of the Lord forever. I'm here to tell you today that if you will allow God to come into your situation, whether it's the mountaintop or the valley, he will meet you there. And his greatness will make a way and his goodness will walk with you every step of it. Stay with us for the next four weeks. Have some conversations with some people around you that raise their hand. I'm just declaring and believing that we're gonna enter this new season knowing, not just saying, not just singing, but knowing that our God, He is too good to not believe. Would you bow your heads at all of our locations? Every head bowed, every eye closed. God, we love you. We thank you. Praise you. Your word in 2 Kings 4. God, I pray for people walking through stressful situations. Have little to nothing left that we would, we would trust you today. We give it to you today. 
we allow you access to even the toughest of situations. Church, every, every head bowed, every eye closed, we give you an opportunity right now to start a relationship with Jesus Christ or, or recommit your life to him. Before you can cry out to God the Father, you have to, to be right with him. And as an unholy person, all of us unholy people, we cannot be reconciled to a holy God. There has to be a relationship. There has to be a bridge built. And that is through a relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus lived a perfect life so he could die as the perfect substitute. He lived for you so he could die as you. The cross gives you access to mercy, grace, forgiveness, your very salvation. The resurrection of Jesus gives us victory over sin in the grave. Our responsibility, our, our part in coming in this relationship is simple, it's to surrender. To surrender control and say, God, have all of me. To confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that he is Lord. And that word Lord is important because that means ownership, rulership, authority. So I wanna ask you today, will you give Jesus authority in your life? Will you make him the Lord of your life? If that's you today at Winter Park, Oviedo, Sanford South, online, to Pastor Justin, that's me. I wanna make Jesus the Lord of my life, either for the first time or, or by recommitting your life today. Jesus is in first place. He's the king, he's the ruler, he's the head. He is Lord of my life. I surrender all of me to follow him. Would you raise your hand right where you are? So I know who I'm praying with. I want Jesus in my life. I got one, two, three, gotcha. Yep, yep, yep. A couple more in the back. Proud of you, yes, see you. Stadium, yep, yep. Come on, Sanford, South, Oviedo. Come on right there in your living room. God's speaking to you. He sees you. We're honored to share this moment with you. Put your hands down in this room and all of our auditoriums. If you raise your hand, would you pray this in your heart as I pray it out loud, say this. Say, God, I love you. And God, I thank you for saving me. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner and I'm saved only by your grace. And I am, I'm confessing with my mouth and I'm believing in my heart that you are the Lord and I'm giving you that place today. Complete and total control. God, have your way. Have your way in my life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. I gotta pray for all of us. I pray this week you give us examples to trust you more, to lay down what we need to lay down, to offer what we need to offer, and to trust. I pray as we walk into this week of prayer and fasting, God, that we're gonna disconnect from the world. We're gonna connect to you. And we're gonna believe for exceedingly abundantly, immeasurably more, miracles in Jesus' name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody at Action Church said amen and amen. Church, can we celebrate all the decisions that were just made? Come on, really celebrate them.